So I, I don't know, uh, for some reason on the notice, I think only my subtitle appeared, but, but this is my title. I want to talk about visual thinking and visual thinking tools and uh, particularly um, what we might be able to say about cognition um, in a simple way that might, that, that can help designers design things, um, design thinking tools. So this is how I expect, um, certainly this is how I work most of the time. Um, this is uh, how I'm productive. I spend my time sort of glued to a computer screen um, working with various kinds of cognitive tools like uh, software development tools, uh, writing tools, uh, um, and PowerPoint, and of course the web. Um, so really, uh, as a, a cognitively productive um, person, it's not me, it's me and the tools, right? It's a, you, we need to think of this as a unit. Um, um, but the problem is we don't really have a, 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 a much of a handle on, on, a, on um, how to deal with this as a unit. You know, how do we, how do we think about cognition and use the same um, sort of language to describe information in somebody's head and information in the computer? Even that is pretty hard to do. So I've created this slide to just um, sort of put a spectrum of, of approaches, of at least the extreme approaches, to how we can approach this problem. Of, uh, you know, we, it would be nice to be able to say something about cognition that, that designers can use in, in designing um, uh, cognitive tools. Um, but how should we do that? Um, so at one end we have Ben Schneiderman with these, um, uh, his mantra, uh, which is a kind of design heuristic, um, overview, zoom, and filter details on demand. But although that's useful, um, it's extremely general, um, and it doesn't actually tell you necessarily you know, in detail what to do. And it really doesn't say very much about cognition. You know, that, that's essentially a, it's a, it's a kind of design heuristic that we should make it easy to get overviews, we should make it easy to zoom in and, and get details. Um, but um, that's pretty acognitive. On the other hand, you've got things like Anderson's Act R, which is the other extreme, which is a, 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 a sort of a simulation of the human brain, um, not doing, doing fairly simple cognitive tasks. So you, you can't simulate sort of creative thought, but you can simulate um, kind of basic cognitive operations in there. Uh, and it's got working memory, and it's got a perceptual module, and it's got all these different modules. And that can, and it also has timing, so you can sort of simulate somebody thinking about some task. And in order to use that for interface design, you have to, on one hand, you have to simulate this, and the other side, you have to simulate your interface, and then you have these two things working together, and, and you can theoretically come up with um, some estimate of how long it's going to take someone to perform a particular cognitive task. The trouble with this is, it takes, well, I, I, I don't know that much about it. I've read a couple of papers, but talking to Stu Card, who spent six months learning this, you're still an amateur after six months. You, and um, not only that, but if you want to you know, do this sort of programming, the, 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 the cognitive activities associated with using a tool into there, that's a hugely labor-intensive process. So this is not really compatible with sort of a iterative design, um, flexible iterative design, where you want to build prototypes and improve them and so on, um, because this thing is, is so labor intensive. So what I'm um, going to propose is something which is sort of more over this side, but um, just a little bit um, that has some, some cognition in there. And I think there's quite a bit of mileage to be gained at that end of the spectrum. Um, this is um, actually the quote that uh, inspired my title. We know next to nothing how collective cognition works. Um, collective cognition, in, in the way he's thinking about it, is actually cognition involving sort of people and computers, but also multiple people, social groups and computers and various kinds of systems. Or how to make it better. We have some ideas, but at best the, they've the status of artisanal rules of thumb. So I guess in some sense what I'm, uh, I would like to um, be able to provide is cognitive rules of thumb that um, we might want to teach people who are learning to design user interfaces. Um, but before um, going on, I want to give you some sort of background in, in a, a, a very quick 
kind of lesson in, in human perception and um, perceptual cognition. Uh, so I, I just want to review some, some sort of basic facts about perception. And certainly thinking about these changed a lot about how I think about how people um, think, per perceive and think visually. So, so this is a sort of segue, a, a 10 minute tutorial on human perception. Visual space, as we sample it, well, we sample it, um, we sample it. We, we don't actually just sort of get the whole thing. Um, we only have detailed vision in a very small area called the fovea in the center of vision, which is exquisitely, um, uh, we can get exquisite detail in that area. We can probably see something like 100 points on the head of a pin, literally held at arm's length in the center of vision. At the side of vision, you can only see something about the size of somebody's head. Um, and so we have to sample the world, and we do that with rapid eye movements, two, um, two or three per second. So the first point here is that we don't see very much. Um, we can't see very much. You know, this, is a, uh, this tells us we can't see very much. This is a very basic kind of perceptual science. This is a, a, the same point, just um, showing some um, what a simulation using Photoshop of what someone sees when they, say, look at a spreadsheet. Uh, they, when you're reading or looking at a spreadsheet, you only see one word, in fact. You don't, you don't see many words and somehow scan them cognitively. You see one word at a time, and, and you have to move your eyes to get them. And, and then the other one is somebody's head at, uh, at the side of the visual field, and all you're picking up about that. And you probably won't even know it's a person unless they happen to be moving. Um, OK, so, so the, the first point is that in any instant, we're not actually taking in very much information. <laughs> The second point is, um, has to do with how much we can retain from one moment to the next. You know, if, how do we perceive the world in all its rich detail? Well, if we're not seeing very much at any instant, somehow you would think that some, we m must be integrating um, the information from a, a whole succession of, of circads, fixations. Um, <clears throat> so working memory is, is what enables us to take information from one fixation to the next fixation a fraction of a second later, uh, among other things. It also, we can hold things for maybe up to a, few, uh, a second or two in working memory, but, but not very much, as I will demonstrate. Um, so um, a nice uh, sort of simple experiment developed by Vogel, Woodman, and Luck um, really spells out the capacity of working memory very clearly. And, and so the, the, this is, I'm just going to demonstrate the experiment. So you fixate that point. Um, you see a bunch of things like this, um, objects, simple objects. Then there's a blank. And then you see a bunch of um, other objects. And uh, I ask, you have to click a button. Are they the same or different? And um, some of you may notice that one of them was different. Um, most of you probably didn't notice that one of them was different. And in fact, um, so I'll just go back just to show that one was different. So, so the uh, one in the lower right um, is different. It changed color. Um, so the, what this experiment tells us, we can't hold very much. Um, what, can, what can we hold in working memory? Well, it's about three objects. So if you do it with three objects like this, then people can perform at about 100%. If you uh, um, give them six objects like this, then they perform about 75%, chance being 50%. So, um, it's just the results from their experiments are very consistent with the capacity of around three simple objects. Um, so how simple or complex can they be? Um, well, they can have multiple attributes. So they can have shape and color and a little bit of texture and maybe a couple of other things. But they can't be very complicated. So you might think, OK, well, if we can only hold three objects, I can get get more into working memory by having more complicated objects. Well, it turns out that if you have even these mushroom-shaped objects, those don't count as a sing single object. Um, if, if I change one of the colors on those, um, then really you act as if you can only see one and a half mushrooms. So, so you can't, so the, there really is not very much that you hold from one instance to the next. So we've got two facts here. You don't get much on each fixation you don't hold much from one fixation to the next. So, so what's the answer to this question? How do we see the world in all its rich detail? And the answer is we don't. 
Um, the basic answer is we do not see the world in, in, in all its rich detail. Um, and, and why not? Well, uh, why, well there's, there's sort of two questions here. Why do we have this illusion that we see the world in all its detail? And that's, that's another question. But um, <coughs> Kevin O'Regan has this nice um, um, phrase, which is the world is his own memory. You don't, you don't need. <laughs> if the world is out there and we can sample it very efficiently, why build a copy of it in your head? Um, that's a very uh, cognitively expensive thing to be able to do, or to have to do, is to build, a, build an image of the world in your head. And in fact, we don't. Um, we, we hold a very little bit of information from the previous few fixations. It does build up a little bit, but it's still not very much. And we sample the world, and we sample the world according to um, our task requirements. So if I tell you to say, I, um, I don't know, look at the world, um, find the woman with the yellow raincoat, then you'll instantly find that. And you'll probably think that you've seen it all the time. But in fact, you haven't. It's just because eye movements are so fast. That, I mean, they're not that fast. They, they take um, a tenth of a second to execute an eye movement. But in cognitive terms, they're fast enough. And our brains are tuned so that we don't even notice we're doing it most of the time. If I go back one. And I, I ask you, you know, what kind of um, lampposts were there in there? I'm sure none of you will uh, know what kind of lampposts there were there. But um, if you've been looking at it, you would have found the lampposts, you know, so fast you probably would think that you sort of knew what the lampposts were all the time because you just somehow saw them. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the point of this is that the, that um, seeing is a very task-related thing. Um, if you are engaged in the activity of looking for somebody, you'll be making very purposeful eye movements, scanning the faces. If you are trying to walk your way through to the tent behind, through the crowd, then your brain will be tuned to the motion patterns of the people there, and, and some part of your brain will be, not at all consciously, but, but aware of the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the edge of the pavement, the edge of the sidewalk there, so you'll lift your feet at the right time. Um, <clears throat> This is a, a, a nice study um, by Mary Hayhoe. Mary Hayhoe and Dalen Ballard have been doing these studies where they uh, do uh, sort of visual thinking in the wild by uh, putting eye trackers on people who are doing natural everyday tasks. And uh, this is somebody making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And uh, again, what you see is extremely purposeful um, fixations. If, if they're Unfortunately, I don't have an animation of this, but if they're in goal, involved in uh, putting the, the peanut butter on the bread, then all the fixations are focused on that. Maybe with a little look ahead to where to put down the, the messy knife to go on and find the jelly or, or something. But, but basically, people are focused on what they're doing with a couple of look aheads to the next part of the task. Um, another point that's important for what comes later. So the first point is working memory in very limited capacity, is that in the middle stage of vision, um, the brain uh, is, pulls out patterns. So a limited number of patterns. Uh, again, it may be something like three. Ullman um, argues that there are uh, processes that pull out patterns and hold them, bind them at any instant. Um, again, depending on our task, um, but there's a very small number of them. Um, so this figure is intended to illustrate that, uh, and th to sort of understand it, you need to sort of focus on some kind of information so you can read the words there. And if you're reading the words, then the other kinds of information kind of fades from your consciousness. If I then ask you to trace out the green line, um, winding through that, then the other kind, uh, again, that bits pulled forward, and literally, um, your low-level um, processes are being retuned. So you're being, you know, the, the, the mechanisms at the low level that attend to lines and greenness are actually being enhanced, whereas the other stuff is being um, somehow, um, uh, you, you, you become less sensitive. Your low-level visual mechanisms become less sensitive. 
and the same thing if you ask you to look at the blurred um, patterns in the background. Now, of course, you know, you're, you're become kind of hyper aware of, of, of what you're looking at. But if you were to do this task for a long time and spend a lot of time, say, just looking at the gray fuzzy figures in fields where other stuff is, is in the way, and, and, but your only task is to look at the gray fuzzy figures on screen after screen, after a little while, you really would become almost um, completely unaware of the other kinds of information. So this is a, a kind of a three-level framework that I like to, that I find useful to think about perception. Um, so we, at the low level, we've got a massive, I haven't really talked about that, it's useful to understand that too, but a massive parallel feature processing machinery, a million um, um, fields, and every one of them we're processing for color differences and little bits of orientation and size information and motion information. In the m middle ground, we've got these sort of feature, um, pattern mechanisms that pull out regions of common texture, um, edges, that kind of stuff. And at the highest level, we have a very small number of um, objects, three, or something like of that order. Um, <clears throat> very little information, well, at the highest level, what we're, in quotes, perceiving is, is, is as much or, or in fact, actually probably a lot more from what we know. You know, if we're seeing a dog, what we perceive has much more to do with what we know about dogs in general or this particular dog than the little bit of information that, that we're holding from one fixation to the next. So we've got a very small, we've got this bottleneck of working memory at the top, patterns there, and uh, patterns in the middle, and, um, uh, well, at this level, there's a huge amount of information being processed in parallel with these low-level features. Okay, so that's, um, that's the end of the, the, the perception tutorial. Now I want to, um, well, first give a, uh, well, I'm going to give three examples of applications. Um, the first one, I just want to mostly illustrate the visual thinking process. So a, a common process in visualization is networks, uh, visualizing networks, so social networks, um, communications networks, uh, semantic networks, whatever, um, which are represented with graphs. This is a social network. Um, the problem is that we can only see uh, typically a diagram, static diagram, with the most kind of 30 nodes and similar number of links before it becomes unintelligible. But of course, real networks are much bigger. Um, this one has a, a f several hundred nodes, I think about 500 nodes. And um, you can see there are a lot of nodes, and you can see there are not a lot of links, but of course you can't actually do anything with that because you can't see the links. And, and you couldn't put labels on all the nodes because um, you wouldn't be able to read them. So. Um, what I'm going to show you is some work I did with uh, Rusty Bobro at BBN in Cambridge and uh, to try and expand the size of the uh, network diagram that you could uh, deal with. Um, not to a huge diagram, but to at least up to a few hundred nodes and links. And the idea is using interactivity. Um, so I'm going to show you the application now. Um, I have a link to it somewhere. Oh, I know where it is. Right here. No. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me just tell you what this is, what you're looking at. This is um, the Fortune 500, the largest connected component of the Fortune 500 companies. And uh, it's color-coded by industry sector, so you've got the finance sector in red, and um, the uh, commercial sector in um, blue, and the... Uh, what this one is the transportation sector. So um, the way this works is now I can explore it interactively um, quite quickly and, and find links. And, and I don't want it, this has all kinds of features, so you can turn on a history feature that lets you find connections between things and, and saves them and so on and so forth. But I don't really want to, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time showing you the application. Mostly I want to show you this because I want to show you somebody thinking, performing a task with a highly interactive process 
and I'm going to show you their eye movement. So we had people in a study um, performing tasks like, oh, I, I didn't, sorry, I didn't explain this um, sufficiently. The gray dots, which are connecting these colored dots, are the, are the links, and the, the, the gray dots are people who are on the board, of, um, directors who are on the boards of more than one company. So this is the graph of connections between companies through boards of directors. Um, and our, um, the task we gave people, well, there were a whole bunch of tasks, but the kind of task was um, which company in the transportation sector is best connected to the finance sector. So they had to, and, and um, I think this is a, a reasonable sort of task. It's a, the kind of thing that you, are do, you, you want to do when you want to um, look at network diagrams, typically, um, if it's a social network or whatever it is, you want to find out fairly short connection links. So if you're, um, if you're trying to find terrorists, then you're interested in fairly short connections between individuals, uh, short chains of connections. <coughs> so um, here's somebody performing the task. And I'm going to replay what they did. So actually, I'm going to slow it down. So I'm going to slow it down by a factor of three. It's now slowed down by a factor of three. And you can see initially what they're doing. So they're asked, well, you know, which tri transportation company is best connected? And they're checking out the color coding, right? Best connecting to the finance. So they look up at the key first, figure out what the uh, coding is. And then they finally decide, hey, OK, this is what I want to do. And so they click on that. And of course, what you want to find is things that are um, orange things that are highly connected to a lot of red dots. And um, they found an example, and you're allowed to move this off and park it at the side and uh, keep on going. You can see, I think one of the things that's interesting about this, they're making about uh, three eye movements to every mouse movement. So it really is quite a tight interactive loop. You know, you can think of these sort of different scales of operations. And I think one of the things that's interesting about it is you know, mouse movements and selections like this are really our cognitive acts, just as eye movements are. And eye movements are also cognitive acts that kind of span um, in, in head cognition to out of the, um, on the screen um, activities. And now they found, um, okay, now they found that other example with a lot, of, and now they're actually counting them. You can, you know, what's neat about this is you can really kind of see um, see in some sense what's going on inside their heads because it, uh, no, I, I shouldn't have been talking there but if you watched that you could really see hey you know I found a candidate here and then you can go really see them go through and count them and then come back and keep on going so this is the kind of tight loop cognition that I think has a, a huge win if you can if you can manage to make this happen of course Ben Schneiderman has done lots of things um, like this, well, the, the whole idea of um, well, brushing is not Schneiderman. Um, um, before Schneiderman is brushing, but dynamic queries uh, fall into this kind of category of a tight loop where you can you can expand the, the number of things that you can deal with from a, a, a. I don't think you can expand it to a huge number, but you can certainly expand it by something like an order of magnitude if you can get the right uh, tight loop into action going. Just gonna quit from this. Take back the. Uh, All right. Okay. Um, second example. And now I want to get into um, something that directly invokes working memory. So this is some work that was done with um, Matt Plumley, a PhD student of mine, <coughs> uh, a few years ago, and. One of the um, one of the big areas of interest in visualization, and, and I guess in Kai in general, is um, <clears throat> how to how to deal with the focus and context problem. How to make it easy to go back between some detailed information to some overview information. And in visual terms, <clears throat> a number of techniques have been proposed. One way of doing it is zooming. You just make as Ben Bateson did you make zooming into a first class act. So you make it really easy to zoom in and zoom out. Um, make it very smooth, make it very uh, um, clean. 
And um, that lets you, of course, get from focus to context if you do it nicely. Uh, another way is to add interlinked windows. So you make those really nice. So you make it very easy to change the focus of a window and, and move the window around and zoom in and out in the, uh, into windows. Um, another method that have been proposed are um, fisheye view. So you bubble up some part of the display to see more detail and, and you leave the other stuff at a, a smaller scale. Um, the question then is, you know, which of these should you use and why? Um, so the problem is, at least we looked at, we only compared zooming versus multiple windows, but I think the, the, the ideas that we, we developed um, can be applied to uh, any kind of focus and context um, display. Uh, that's visual, anyway. Um, <clears throat> prior to this work, a few people have done studies of, of different um, focus and context techniques, but they've been essentially atheoretical. You know, they just compared, some, they'd taken some task, compared it, um, done with interface A, uh, uh, compared interface A with interface B, and, and come up with some results. But essentially, you're always left wondering, well, what about, you know, some other problem? Which, which is going to be best and why? Because there, there was essentially no theory. It just said, this particular task, this particular interface won. Um, but that's, that doesn't allow for much generality. Um, <clears throat> so the task, I'll tell you the task and then I'll tell you the theory. Um, <clears throat> so our task was finding patterns that matched in this. So we had this sort of abstract information space that we'd uh, created... Um, had clusters of objects, little islands of information in here, and uh, your task is, are these identical? And the, uh, hopefully you can see this clearly, because the, we deliberately introduced this colored noise in the background, and that's so that you couldn't just do it by sort of catching glimpses of pixels in here, you know, because you can see a single pixel of color. So that was to force you to have to zoom, either zoom in or use the windows to get the view. But in this case, there is a difference, so, so it's these cones and um, other objects that you had to compare. And this, this object is different, so, so the answer is no. But you had to go around and find, um, <coughs> find groups that, 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 well, there was always one, pat, one there were, was always an island of information that matched your, your base island of information. And you just, we just measured how long it took you to do it. And you could do it with a zooming interface, so you zoomed in on your original, um, on the uh, starting point of information and then you zoomed out and you zoomed in to the next patch and so on. Uh, in the zooming interface, in, in this multiple window one, you drag the focus around. So you could just drag this focus from point to point. Okay, so what is the... Um, you can describe this with a very simple kind of cognitive systems model involving uh, both the computer interface and some cognitive elements, as we'll see. So. What does it take to do this? Well, the time is the setup cost. The setup cost means how long does it take you to create these extra windows if you're going to do it with the window interface, plus the number of visits. So a visit is just focusing your attention on one group or another group um, times the time per visit. So the time per visit is how long it takes you to actually uh, decide whether something's the same or not. And the key point here is the number of visits is a, the, uh, is a function of the number of objects compared um, to be compared and visual working memory capacity, i.e. n over m, um, where m is visual working capacity. So the number of objects is just the number of objects in these little clusters. So in this case, there are seven. So we did it with different, you know, if working memory, what I've been telling you about working memory information, you can do this task yeah, I, I fixate here, I can pick up three objects, right? I make an eye movement down here, and I compare those three objects mentally. It takes about 40 seconds per object to compare them. Um, and then I can grab three more objects, move my eyes up here and compare them, and then there's one left, and so I have to make one final movement back. So there's three eye movements necessary. If I'm zooming, though, of course I have to zoom in um, <coughs> on um, the, group, uh, the group A, pick up three objects, zoom out, and zoom in on group B, um, and make the comparison. So now instead of comparing eye movement times, we're comparing 
zooming times as being the principal cost. <coughs> and so this is the prediction the, that he modeled before doing the experiment. And I, I like showing this because I've never actually done anything that actually had a sort of the results so, so closely matched the prediction. Um, so in the multi-window case, of course, it takes longer to set up these windows, even though actually in this interface it was uh, highly optimized. So, um, but still, um, in many windows, in many interfaces, of course, it might take you quite a, quite a few mouse clips to be able to create a new window, unless you could sort of remember how to get there. But in any case, um, if there's only one object to be compared, you're better off zooming. It's going to take less time. So this is the, the number of objects in your clusters going from one up to eight. Um, and um, this is the prediction for zooming. This is a prediction for multi-window. With multi-window, it's once you've set up the windows, then the curve is very flat because eye movements are so much quicker than zooming. So it doesn't take very much. It takes a couple more eye movements, but that's really a pretty low cost if you have uh, uh, if you have um, extra windows available. Um, zooming, of course, gets costly quite quickly. So that was the prediction. This is the results. And indeed, we found this nice crossover at about three objects in the clusters. And so here's a, a cognitive um, design heuristic. It simply says that if we need to compare more than two or three simple pattern components, add windows. Now, of course, um, it, it depends, you know, to some extent on how, how easy it is in your interface to set up an extra window. You know, that's, that's one of the design decisions. But still, now we have a, a, a cognitively based heuristic based on, on um, working memory capacity that um, can apply to many different situations. And I don't think it just, is, uh, you know, a, a, the whole point of focus and context is somehow to, com to relate. You don't necessarily, it's not always, a, your task isn't always trying to say, is this an identical to that? It's some other kind of comparison between something you're seeing visually and something else you're seeing. But still, the principle holds, right? So I think that this is quite a general, um, <clears throat> a general rule that any time you're, you're trying to decide you know, when I need to sort of save information, when I need to optimize something, uh, and, and where I'm making some kind of visual comparisons, this is the sort of thing that you need to think about. <coughs> so, my final example um, has to do with a study, um, uh, um, tools for my, um, a study that I've been doing with um, marine biologists on uh, humpback whale behavior. And the uh, or wide turning time into space is a good idea. So just to give you a bit of the background um, on where the data is coming from, um, I've been going out on this ship. This is Nancy Foster for the last seven years out uh, on Stellwagen Bank, uh, leaving at Woods Hole, um, leaving from Woods Hole. Um, and what our goal is to study the underwater behavior of humpback whales. Dave Wiley is the chief scientist. And the core piece of technology is this thing uh, developed by a Woods Hole engineer called Mark Johnson. And this is uh, uh, called DTAG. Um, and what this has in it is sort of the, the same thing as a, an iPhone, I guess. It's sort of roughly the same set of uh, instruments anyway. It's got, a, it's got acceler three axis accelerometers, three axis magnetometers, sound recording, and pressure sensing, which gives you depth in, in this case. Now, um, an iPhone, I guess, has a pressure-sensitive screen, um, so um, it probably wouldn't survive 1,000 meters. But that's, um, this thing costs about $15,000, but otherwise fairly similar. So how do you get it on the whale? This is how you get it on the whale with a, a long pole. And there it is. It's just been placed on that whale. Um, you can see there's the tag attached to the whale. So um, the task that's um, fallen to me and my group is to find new behaviors. Um, 
I mean, it, this wasn't the task initially, but I've more and more gotten involved in this project, and, it, and it's more and more fallen to me to find the, the new behaviors. I mean, <clears throat> so what is the new behavior? In, in this case, it's any stereotype pattern. Uh, nobody had ever, this instrument, at least the first year we went out was 2004, and this instrument had only been developed the previous year, so this is the first time anyone had ever stuck anything like this onto a humpback whale. And so but nobody had any idea what humpback whales do underwater. Um, so um, the, basic, the, the basic goal is just to find anything that where um, a whale does something many times is of interest. If, if several whales do the same thing, then it's even more interest. Um, so the cognitive algorithm looks something like this. Repeat. Um, review behavior sequence looking for patterns. Remember the patterns. Look for more instances until there are no new patterns. So we're trying to find some kind of kinematic pattern. Um, this is the old way that people um, used to uh, process this kind of data. So they just basically do time series plots of, uh, of um, depth, pitch, um, um, roll, and so on. And it's pretty hard to actually integrate that. Our first uh, attempt to deal with this problem um, was um, to use GeoZooey, and that's actually how our involvement came about. Uh, <coughs> I should uh, perhaps mention that GeoZooey is developed by Matt Pomley and Roland Arsenault and myself, and, and it's a geographic zooming user interface 4D, and it was a, an experimental project, or still is ongoing actually, to um, try and deal with um, time-varying geospatial data. And we were invited to Woods Hole. We went to Woods Hole um, basically looking for some users, because if you develop tools like this, you want some people with some cool data. So uh, we gave a talk down there, and uh, Dave Wiley took us up on it. So that was how the project kind of got started. He, he, he took us out uh, on the first cruise, and we got hold of some of the data. And uh, I've actually uh, got this thing hopefully still running in background. Uh, there it is. So this is what GeoZooey looks like. This is um, Cape Cod, of course, uh, Stellwagen Bank. Um, the first year, there actually were no whales there. Um, we were, the project initially was about whether whales avoid whale watching boats, but there were no whales <laughs> on Stellwagen Bank. Um, they were actually turned out to be here, so we took off to the Great South Channel. And so we had, this is actually um, fishing boats, but we uh, monitored those and we can zoom in on a whale and we can uh, play it. So you can actually hear the thing too. Um, so, and there's all kinds of cool features in here. So I can uh, click on this and I'm in the frame of reference to the whale. I can um, um, add extra windows and I can attach it to that whale and then I can, uh, whoops, I need to attach it to that whale foot swims away. There it did. It disappeared. I lost it. Anyway, if you click on an object, you're in its frame of reference automatically. And then you can go off and find other things. Um, so we added all these features to try and help them analyze data. Um, object. So we added these uh, space-time notes that allow you to go back and look at some event um, and record it and code it. And, and so we added all these features to try and help them with analysis of this data. Um, you can also hear the sound. You're, um, Anyway, I think you've seen enough of that. I'll, I'll tell <laughs> um, you. You take the accelerometer and the magnetometer data to get attitude. Well, it's not, yeah, you can turn it into old pitch and yaw. But, but you basically have a, you, you, the accelerometer vectors tell you where down is, and the magnetometer deck vectors tell you sort of basically where north is. And then the, the, in tag coordinates, and then the trick is trying to get the sort of whale on the tag. Um, and, and you also get depth pretty well directly from pressure. 
So what we get is a time series of, of orientations. <coughs> and, and we turn into this. Are you receiving this data all the time? Or no, no. Uh, uh, you, you, you get the tag back. And um, it stays on for about 24 hours. And then you pick it up oh, okay. and um, get the data and process it. Um, so we developed this tool. Um, and we developed all these features that we hope they would use to, um, to, to make it attractive to analyze the data. And they didn't use it. Um, <laughs> um, they loved it. I mean, they loved it. They loved seeing the whales swimming around and making the noises. And they, and they loved the videos. They could show the videos at conferences. So this makes high quality videos. But they did not use it for analysis. And um, so I thought a lot about this. And, and uh, I think it, this uh, kind of cognitive analysis that I've been talking about can be used to explain why. Um, so if you think about the cognitive process for finding new behaviors, um, you basically, you repeat, you have to review the behavior sequence looking for patterns by playing it back, right? Well, that, if you're a 24-hour tag, it takes, 20, well, you can maybe speed it up by a factor of three. You can speed, play it at any, any speed you want in that tool. But still, it takes a long time. It takes hours and hours. Um, and then you remember the patterns recording using the space-time notes, so that's clicking on and recording the little notes that were late. Um, then you look for more instances, and that may involve reviewing. If you, if you happen to find something that you think you might have seen before, you know, you might not notice it was a significant pattern before, but then all of a sudden you think, oh, this whale's doing all this stuff. I wonder if those other guys were actually doing it too. Now you have to go back and review all those other guys that you've already processed once. Uh, and we're actually extremely poor at remembering sort of abstract motion patterns. So there's a, th this is a very, very tricky thing to do. Um, and the basic cost is k times the playback time. So it takes, um, this is actually how people do process whale data for acoustic signals. Um, when they're trying to listen for the, you know, trying to interpret all these different sounds they're making, they do exactly this kind of stuff. But anyway, they, they, they didn't do it for, the, for the, um, the kinematic patterns of the whales. And so the next year, I, I produced this other tool called, that I call track plot. And this is, um, in some ways, it may seem similar. It is similar. But it's, um, it's completely track-oriented. So um, it turns the track into this ribbon pattern, um, which allows you to much better see the sort of the shape of the ribbon and the, the motion. It's color coded when the animal's rolling. And immediately you can see that there are these repeated um, stereotyped rolls. The, um, these sawtooth patterns, by the way, are um, based on the angular acceleration around the lateral axis. So they, they, they reveal the fluking of the, the animal. So you can see, for example, that it's uh, swimming vigorously up and it stops swimming at a certain depth and, it, and it's, um, when it goes down it actually just glides down. Um, so you can see various kinds of patterns like that. Um, and you can immediately see these kinds of, uh, well, extremely um, interesting um, stereotype patterns. So here's somebody doing a whole series of side rolls one after another. Various kinds of foraging patterns. There's another, another one up there. And um, so on. This is burst and glide swimming, which is an efficient, efficient form of swimming that uh, most fish and whales, marine mammals, engage in. So you can see it flukes and then glides, flukes and then glides. This is breathing at the surface. <coughs> um, these are various forms of bubble net feeding. And, and as a result of doing this, We've uh, uh, just sent off a paper on uh, classifying different, cl different types of bubble net feeding, which weren't no known before. Um, bubble net feeding is where they swim around in a, a, a sort of upward spiral, blowing bubbles, which helps them um, contain the fish. And then they, uh, well, there's actually, there are two forms. So one, one of them, they swim around in a spiral, and then they lunge on the way up. Um, whale, humpback whales are lunge feeders. So they, um, the way they feed is they, um, they have these expandable pleats on, on the uh, on their uh, front, a hugely enlarged mouth that goes something like uh, two-thirds of the way back their body. Um, and so they can engulf about 20 cubic meters of water. And so they, they, they open their mouths about 90 degrees, um, engulf 20 cubic meters of water, and then expel it through the baleen, you know, filtering out whatever's, whatever they get. Um, 
anyway, so this is all about um, in, in this, these double loop behaviors, they're uh, swimming around in a loop blowing bubbles and then they slap the water with their tail at the top and then they go around in a second loop and they come up having um, engulfed the, uh, uh, the 20 cubic meters and they expel it at the surface. Um, people do use this. They didn't use the other one. And again, if you think about the cognitive model, you know, we're the same, it's the same algorithm uh, at a high level, but now uh, we repeat, review the behavior sequence looking for patterns, which is basically by eye movements. If you can get to the right vantage point in that, some of those images I was showing many, many hours of, of whale uh, behavior. And, and you can just see the visual, visually the way that ribbon is twisted tell you what the, uh, the kinematics were. And so you can just make eye movements picking up, hey, there's the same pattern here and the same pattern there. Um, so it's vastly more uh, uh, efficient than sort of replaying the movements. Um, <clears throat> and you, you look for more instances, and you may have to review previous tracks, but you just take snapshots of these things, post them on the wall whenever you, um, I, I, I keep a catalog of all the behaviors that we know, and then you can just um, compare them to that until you find no, no new patterns. And so this tool has been extremely successful. It's been instrumental in at least five published papers so far, and I think another five or so in the works. Um, um, so the gain in efficiency in this case for, was from many hours or even days in the old, uh, um, the, the GeoZooey uh, approach to, uh, um, in some sense, at least to the first cut of, of knowing what you've got, a few minutes. I mean, literally, with track plot, when, when we get the data off a tag, within half an hour, we know if you know, this animal is bubble net feeding using this type of maneuver. Um, we have a pretty good picture of everything it's doing, whether it was doing something new that we hadn't seen before. Whereas before, well, actually, whereas before, literally, um, nobody ever processed the data because they just never sort of <laughs> got around to it. Um, so it really has made the difference between people analyzing this data and not analyzing it. Um, as a broader design heuristic, I think it suggests that we really should be generally, and, and of course I think people do this anyway, but we should turn time into a spatial pattern wherever you can, uh, one that converts critical events into uh, um, shapes or patterns. It's, that's not necessarily easy, of course. I mean, it worked with the, these whale trajectories, but they're, I'm sure lots of um, time varying events that maybe don't have a natural mapping to spatial patterns. Yeah. Well, the whole, at least I, visualization is, seems to be most useful at the sort of discovery stage where you don't actually know what the patterns are. And that's certainly the case here. So we do use statistical methods. But this really gives us an intuitive feel for what's going on. Um, and we certainly, we don't have this, we don't have any robust sort of automatic pattern finders that will work on this data. I mean, I sort of think that, I mean, maybe if I was more of a computer scientist, I, I'd look into the sort of handwriting literature and try and figure out, because that's about space-time trajectories, and somehow use some of those algorithms to pull out patterns in there, but... Um, Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, this is the sort of thing I've been talking about, and, and I uh, hope I've convinced you that knowing a little bit about cognition um, can help us um, design user interface if we can somehow develop the right kind of sort of calculus and w some way of describing these, um, these basic tight loop processes that I think are, can be really useful. Of course, the real world looks much more like this. Um, you know, um, I, I, in individual, we've got all these little collaborating processes that do something inside your head. And you've got all these uh, collaborative processes in the, in the computer um, that have input from hundreds, if not thousands, of different designers, uh, ultimately, not to mention the internet with um, sources of information. And on the individual side, you've got your social network um, that, that's also informing how you uh, do cognition. Um, 
I have no idea how to attack that kind of problem, which is why I'm trying to do this little uh, tight loop thing, which I think has got some, uh, some possibility of, uh, of um, there are possibilities for progress in this sort of a, the, the kind of tight loop um, behaviors I've been describing. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's really what I'm, I'm aiming towards is, is simple cognitive process models simple kind of ways of describing the cognitive algorithm in ways that encompass both things that go on inside the head and things that go on in the computer. And hopefully that, that kind of approach can be useful for design. And uh, so to acknowledge some of the collaborators, Dave Wiley, Rusty Barbaro, Matt Plumley is a PhD student, and Gilman, who is also a PhD student of mine. Thank you. Yes. Uh, interesting question. I, I really like, especially in the. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I can hear you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I really like the, uh, the you know, the uh, uh, ribbon plot of, mm -hmm. of the whale uh, behavior. Uh, if if I asked you, uh, you know, we want to look at uh, uh, pat look for patterns at different scale levels. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, using your ribbon display mm -hmm. as sort of the, the base, how then would you apply what you just told us to uh, avoid, you know, the, the, the zooming activity if that's the kind of uh, pattern you want to look at? In other words, you wanted to see if there's micro patterns, macro patterns, uh, patterns that show up in the small and in the large, but just, you know, uh, expanded in time. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a hard time actually imagining this. Um, I mean, that's, not, that's certainly not what my data is. Um, I guess the more, the more I do design, the, the more I tend to think it's very Id idiosyncratic. I, I find it very hard to answer an abstract question like that without actually having a mental model of the data you might be thinking of. Um, well, sorry. An example, an example might be, uh, you know, that they, there's there are certain role maneuvers they do mm -hmm. uh, that that's based on their velocity. So, you know, if if they're going slow, the rolls are slow. If they're going mm -hmm. fast, the rolls are fast, or mm -hmm. or maybe maybe not. So, I mean, that might be an example of something that happens at a cross scale. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I, I guess you. Well, you ideally want something that will somehow identify that pattern, so and, and automatically then, say, code it in some way that then you can say zoom out and see, you know, where this kind of pattern occurs. I mean, we are doing stuff like that because we're, we're, we're aiming towards stuff like that anyway because we want to know how uh, <coughs> whale feeding behavior correlates with um, things like uh, ocean fronts uh, from ocean current models. So. Um, they, they feed along the standing waves along the inside edge of the bank, and so we want to be able to, say, zoom out and see where all of these little, uh, uh, you know, where they relate in both space and time to the ocean current model data and features in there. Um, I guess in, in, in answer, I, I don't actually know any way, I don't know a general purpose way of sort of creating tools that will answer that problem. I, the only way I know is the, the very laborious way of building tools that are designed to, once I've come up with a scientific question, then building tools to support it. Um, that's probably not a very good answer, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, Over here. Oh. Uh, I've noticed that uh, a lot of your information visualizations are quite striking and beautiful. I was wondering if you had ever uh, considered or if you've ever displayed your uh, visualizations as art pieces. And if not, I strongly suggest you do. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, don't, I, I wouldn't know how to go about that. <laughs> <coughs> um, Two or three questions: are, are the tools available? Is the data available? You know, for uh, which? <laughs> well, the the uh, the whale data. Uh, samples. The, the the 
the, they tend to be very jealous about that stuff. Cost them a lot to get it. <laughs> Pardon? It costs them a oh, lot to does, get it. Oh, it does, but it's, it's actually gathered it by, through government money. Sure. And so sure. I actually wanted to give the, the, the tool is definitely available. Yeah. And samples of the data are available. Uh, I, I actually would have liked to put the, put the tool and the data, mm -hmm. all of it, from the last several years on, on, the, on a website. But yeah. <laughs> they don't want that to happen. Um, <laughs> that, that actually is, I mean, that, that's a very serious question. Sure. Because people do, um, at least NSF wants people to do exactly that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Right. But it's taking a lot, uh, there's a lot of pushback. So. The, uh, uh, have they looked at any vocalizations before movement or before feeding or vocalizing mm -hmm. and then the, the group gets together where here you've got the kinematics mm -hmm. but you've also got the vocal recording mm -hmm. and it would be interesting to data mine that as well. It would. Um, there's a woman called Alison Stimpert who's part of this team from the University of Hawaii and she's been looking at that although actually the, the, the vocalizations are not that they, they don't seem to clearly correlate with anything. I mean, some animals do seem to make a particular noise before they, they do a maneuver, but then another animal won't do anything like that. We actually do have some, we have some great data that I've just started working on where we have a mom and calf in Antarctica for lunging together. And so I've added the facility where you can put the two ribbons together and, and watch them behaving together, which is, uh, um, I can show people afterwards if they like, which is very cool. Um, because uh, we're, for, we're basically seeing a, a mom teaching the calf how to lunge feed for the first time. But there, uh, yeah, actually, the vocalization issue is you can actually hear the, the, the vocalizations from the mom on the calf's tag. And we can use that to actually measure the distance between them. So, On your second to last slide, uh, you said you say something about the proper use of texture and color. What do you, can you say a little more about what you mean by the proper use of texture and color? Oh, um, not, not in a, a small, I mean, most of my career I've, I've spent doing studies of low level perception. I mean, I, I used to be a color vision scientist, so, but, but you know, just, you know, what is the right color sequence? How, how do you use color? If you want to use texture to reveal whatever, atmospheric pressure. I've, I've been actually doing a lot of work recently with flow models and, and trying to show atmospheric pressure and, and, and um, temperature and the flow patterns and so on all simultaneously. But, but it, it's very much about exactly how you can, it, uh, how best to use those kind of channels. Um, but it's not something that, that I can give a short answer to. I just mean that uh, there are guidelines for, to do that, which are again based on what we know about human perception, and in some sense, that kind of approach to things is much older. You know, people have people have been studying, say, color vision, and using it to establish guidelines for the use of color for for a very long time. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Were, were the scientists uh, interested in that particular feeding pattern before? Uh, engaging you in the process, and, and how important was that to uh, the, um, the method you undertook to, to visualize that? That particular, well, we didn't know that particular feeding pattern existed. Um, so in that sense, they weren't. Um, it's actually taken a long time to get around to um, publishing some of this stuff. Um, it's not quite true, actually. There, there was one paper about 15 years ago that hypothesized that they might be doing because of scuffings on the side of their mouths. But this, and we still don't know what, actually what they're doing for the bottom feeding um, because they're, um, well, they're not lunge feeding. There's other, there's other evidence that we know they're not lunge feeding, so we don't actually know what they're doing and how they're getting. We, we know they're probably feeding on sun land, sand lance, which are these little eely things. So, which were in vast numbers out on Stellwagen Bank, but um, yeah. Hi, uh, two sort of related questions. One is, do the whales stay away or behave differently with whale watch boats? <coughs> and the second, right, we still don't know. I mean, that's the trouble. We have. You can't really do controlled studies. Uh, um, Actually, they don't because sort of you're want. actually a boat that's watching the whales too, so you can't. You're not totally <laughs> separated from them. Yeah, I've suggested that actually. It's a very sensitive issue. Bothering whales is a very sensitive issue, um, and so um, it's. In fact, the only good data. I mean, if I were to try and answer that question, I would actually take the proximity of the boats 
that we were using to the whales because we actually have GPS, you know, we have lots of data on that. But they don't want to go near that, actually. Oh, well, so, the other uh, question is... But, you... anyway, but, but, the, but the trouble is that they're, they're so varied in their behavior, and the sample we have is so small, even after eight years of doing it, that, that um, you know, every year they're doing a different kind of sort of feeding and doing different things. Well, that, so, that brings me to the other part of the question. Was there any um, behavior that was enormously unexpected that you observed by doing this? Oh, well, all the bottom feeding was enormously un unexpected. Um, so people generally think about humpback whales as these sort of bubble net surface feeders, and now all of a sudden we, we now know that more than half the time, and probably half of that they're doing something rather mysterious on the bottom. I mean, it's almost certainly feeding. You know, we don't know for sure that all these side whales are feeding, but they sort of have to be if you're doing it that much. So that's, yeah, that's, that was extremely unexpected. Yeah, uh, yeah have, um, have you introduced uh, seasonality into the models at all, comparisons across time of... Uh, we only get the tags on for, for 24 hours, typically, at the longest. And so we don't have long time series. Okay. Well, a big problem with, with whales and any smooth skin marine mammal is attaching things to it. <laughs> That's, we, so this thing was attached with suction cups which doesn't do it any harm. But it, it actually is horrendously difficult to attach something, a long-term tag to a whale. Um, there's one group in Alaska that does it, and the, the, the stainless steel spikes that long with a triple row of barbs, and it has to go right through the blubber into the muscle before it will stay attached. And, and it, you know, most people won't, won't do that. Yeah, I, so, uh, actually what I, I So there are no long, well, very little time series. A long-term time series. Yeah, my other question was more, you know, um, do the patterns change in the spring and summer or, or different? Not enough. I mean, the only data that we have is, um, well, uh, we have now a good data set from Antarctica. So the last two years we've been down to Antarctica tagging humpback whales. And we have a good data set here, and that's, that's it for humpback whales with tag data. But, um, and, and that's just, you know, that's just for a month in the summer, pretty much always the same month, June. So they, in the winter, they actually go off and breed in, in the equatorial areas. So they're not actually feeding. Um, they're, they're feeding in the... In the uh, so we have time for about two more questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the eye tracking uh, that you had on the uh, first example. Have, have you done something similar with the uh, ribbons on, on how people, what, what they're looking at and, and what they're fixing on, like when they're trying to search for patterns? Um, no, not really. That, that project has really been motivated much more by uh, sort of other considerations. But I'm, I'm starting to do some more eye-tracking stuff now. Uh, I, I, yeah, eye-tracking, I think, is wonderful because it really does, you do feel, in some, at least in some cases, that you're really seeing people you know, sort of think visually in, in some way that you don't, you don't get that kind of, kind of information any other way. Oh, hi. So your ribbon visualizations were, were I agree, were very beautiful. They seemed to be missing one thing, which was a directional reference, like up. So it seems like you'd want to have um, the surface re re represented so they know the representation of the movement towards the surface of the water. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, I, I guess if you actually use the tool, I think you very quickly, it is an interactive tool and you can very easily... Oh, so you can angle. orbit. That was the other question I had. So you could, the scientists could orbit around it. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, okay. absolutely. It's, it's, um, and so it became it's clear... That, yeah. So it's always sort of whale-centered, but it's got all kinds of ways of rapidly moving back and forward along the track and marking places and all those kinds of things. Okay, thanks. So, uh, and you can actually replay the whale running along its ribbon. It's kind of like a roller coaster ride. Okay. <laughs> Track plot. <laughs>